here. Am I on? I think I'm on. Am I on? Am I on? Yeah, I am on. See, it's not my fault for once. There we go. Well, I loved this morning. And, uh, you know, you can tell when God's involved in something because he's directing the traffic. And I feel perfectly set up by God to follow what just happened and what we just heard with the message that I feel God has given me to invest into you this morning. And uh, we're going to kind of go leadership teaching. We're going to kind of go staff training. One of the things that I get to do from time to time around the world with different settings is to sit in a room with staff and kind of talk business. And so I feel like we're going to do that. We've already done that. And so we're just going to right now just ready our hearts because there's a lot of information going on. And with conferences, what can happen is you can get kind of punch drunk. You're like, whoa, you're like, I need time out the ring to like take it all in. And, you know, we just need to make room for the more that God has for us. And as leaders, we just need to sometimes just take a moment and go, okay, God, I parked that one up and now I'm making room for this. And so I want us to lean in and pray that God gives you some wisdom today for maybe some tough stuff you're dealing with. I'm about to talk to you about pain. And if anyone should know what that looks like and feels like, it's leaders. And maybe today this word will minister to you, heal some of you. That was my prayer before I got here today, that for some of you in an area which has been tender for you, there would be a healing. There would be a sense of God in it with you. There would be a sense of relief that comes. And for some of you, I want to affirm you that though everything about you is struggling with the decisions you've made, I kind of want to lean over you and breathe on you a God word that says you've made the right choice. It might be the hardest choice you've had to make, the most painful choice you've had to make, but I want you to hear God say you made the right choice. So God, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you that you are a good, good father. God, in this room, there are so many different stories like we've heard this morning. So many tests that each leader is going through and right now is in the middle of. God, there is hurt and there is pain that many right now are experiencing. And some of it is nothing to do with their choice, but it's the choice of others. And God, I just pray in this next few moments that you would heal any wounds, that you would wash the weary, that you would refresh the tired, and that you would affirm those that right now are saying, God, have I made the right choice? And God, once more, I pray that I would get out of the way. God, I just pray in this next segment, Holy Spirit, have your way. Just have your way. Correct, challenge, change, just have your way. Today, this word for some of you is going to make you need to make a different decision. Some of you are in reaction and God's going to challenge you. But I am asking you in this moment, every single one of us to say, God, you have your way. And if I'm wrong, God, then help me get right. And if I'm making a bad call, God, help me make the right call. In Jesus' name, amen. You may take your seats. I guess I'll start with one of the, one of my most favorite actual stories in the Bible. It's a really random story and at different times in my journey in leadership, I will pull this story out with my own staff and my own team. So maybe this can become a story that you teach your team and your staff. And uh, I guess I'll start with it and then I'll go on to talk about what I feel God's put on my heart. It's a random story. There's sometimes stories in the Bible and you're like, why is that even in there? It is so random. It seems almost insignificant. It seems like a Was there nothing else to write about? And that was like the report of the day. It's 
kind of an odd one because really it's just about a prophet making stew. And the story is in two kings. And it's in chapter 4, and it's in verse 38 that we read this strange, quirky story about Elisha and a school of leaders, and Elisha deciding that actually the first thing he's going to do when he gets to this group of young, hungry leaders that are wanting him to teach them and to train them, he recognizes there's a famine in the land, and so before I do my thing, I'm going to take care of the thing that actually is bothering you all, which is you're just physically hungry. We could all just take a leadership lesson right there. That some of you are preaching your latest and greatest sermons to your team, and actually they are just hungry. And some of us are trying to impress, and actually they just need you to just stop and just ask them how they are. And some of us are giving them lots of tasks and agendas and strategies, but they just actually need you to eyeball them and say, are we all good? I love that this great man of God noticed all the needs. But what I love about this story is that Elisha, he shows up and he says, we're, we're going to make some stew. <laughs> and so the Bible tells us that he comes and he says, go get a large pot. Let's cook some stew for these prophets. So one of them, they went out into the fields and they gathered herbs and they found a wild vine and they picked as many of its gods as his garment could hold. He was the zealous one in the group. There's always one, isn't there, in the team that's keen to impress. I got it. I'm going to go get all the stuff for the stew, man of God. I'm going to go out there and get all the vines and I'm, I'm going to fill my garment. I'm going to come back with the most resources and the most stuff and I'm going to show you that I'm keen. He was the zealous one in the group. And this guy goes out and he goes and gets the ingredients for the stew and he cut them up and it says that he threw them in the pot and no one knew what they were. And then they made the stew and it says the stew was poured out for the men. But as they began to eat it, they cried out, man of God, there is death in the pot. And they couldn't eat it. So I want you to imagine for a moment the scenario that's playing out, which is that the prophet has come and he said to the team, hey, we're just going to take care of one of the needs right now, which is we're going to make some stew and we're going to eat together. And so in the zealousness of everybody going and contributing, everybody begins to throw stuff in the pot, right? And if you think about team and if you think about how we do life, a lot of times when we lead team and when we build church, we do exactly the same scenario. We say, hey, we're going to make something. We're going to make something to feed people with. And I want you all to be empowered to contribute to the pot. You all get to throw something in this pot. You get to throw an idea in. You get to throw your gift in. You get to throw... That's team church. It's the empowerment of people to contribute to the pot that will then feed other people, right? And there's always someone in the team that is zealous and excitable and has a cray-cray idea. And there's always one that's, you know, throwing stuff in the pot. And, and as a leader, sometimes you don't have time to check everything that went in the pot. Right? And so that's what's happening. So now all these hungry guys are sat down to eat what has been put in the pot. And someone tastes it. And this is, this is team goals right here. Because someone tastes it. And as soon as they taste it, they say, whoa, everybody stop. There's something off in this pot. Someone's thrown something in this pot that doesn't taste like we want it to taste. Hey guys, everybody stop eating because if you swallow what I just swallowed doesn't taste good. This is what you want in your team. You want a team that are so good with one another, so all want each other to win, that there's no ego stroking, and there's enough honesty in the room that when it doesn't taste right, you just shout it out and go, it doesn't taste right. <laughs> Someone threw a fence in the park. Hey, hey, this doesn't taste like what our pastor said we should be making. This doesn't taste right. I, I, I don't want anyone else to eat what is in the pot. 
There's something in the part that, that tastes of an attitude. There's something in the part that tastes about an agenda. There's something. That's what we heard this morning. It's going to happen as you build a team, as you build a church. There's going to be the guy that has the pride issue. There's going to be the guy that has an agenda. There's going to be the girl that is insecure. But the idea is that we build such a community that instead of it going underground and everybody getting poison, we have enough liberty in our team to go, I think there's something off in the pot. So as bold as anything, this guy doesn't care who it was that dropped in and he's not asking for anyone to be pulled into the middle and called to account. He's just saying, for the sake of the bigger picture, I've tasted something that doesn't taste quite right. I, just as a side note, before we carry on this message, feel to say to some of you pastors and leaders in here, be careful who you let feed your team. You might bring a speaker in, and they might be awesome, but if there's something off, if there's an agenda that's off, and you taste it, then you need to know that what you're tasting is what your team are also tasting. And what they walk away with is the poison that was in the pot, not just the stew that was in the pot. And they're going to think that's what you want them to eat. And therefore, they're going to start making stew like that in their department too. So, so when we taste it and you feel like that's a little God prompt, something was off. You know, I've been around people that are very gifted. But there was something about what they said that just was a little off. I can't put my finger on it, but the aftertaste in my mouth is not good. <laughs> Death in the pot. There's death in this pot. Everybody stop eating. And here's what I want to show you, and this is just the intro, and then we'll get to the message. This one's for free. Elisha goes, everybody put your spoons down. Nobody needs to panic. Don't need to go on a witch hunt. Don't need to freak out. Elisha says this. Get me some flour. And he got the flour. And he put the flour in the pot. And then he said, okay, we're all good. Everybody carry on eating. Here's what I want to suggest to you today. We need more leaders with more flour. With wisdom that becomes flour in the pot. Because this is what we often do as immature leaders. When we hear there's death in the pot, we get the pot and we throw all the stew out. Well, there's death in this pot, so I'm just gonna throw it out. I'm gonna throw your idea out, I'm gonna get rid of the staff member, I'm gonna get rid of the team, I'm gonna get rid of the department, I'm gonna get rid of the conversation, because you know what, there's death in this pot. But you know what, every time we throw the stew out, we have to start all over again. And I think God wants us to become more mature and go, yes, there is death in the pot, but I have flour in my pocket. And the flour in my pocket is wisdom that will neutralize the poison, will settle the unsettled, will stabilize the insecure, will help someone in their proving ground test, will come and put a word in the ear of the young man that wants to start his own church and it's not the right time. And my flour in this pot will save the stew. What we just heard Pastor Kevin talk about was someone saying, I want to save the stew. And so I want to ask you to do something that is flower to the pot instead of death in the pot. And I think a lot of us in our teams, we have thrown stuff out that was complete wastage that did not need to be wasted. If we'd have just had flour in our pocket, we could have saved the stew. And so I guess what I want to go on to teach you in the next few moments that I have with you is some flour. I want to give you some flour. Flour for your pocket as you leave here. Flour for the times when it feels unbearable and the weight feels too heavy. Flour for the times when you want to lash out, but flour would say, don't lash out. Flour to hold you in a time when you want to run. Flour to maybe hold your tongue when you could have your say. It's just some flour for your pocket because I think God 
wants you to save the stew, not throw it away. I think all those years that you have labored, he wants you to build on, not throw away with some dumb thing you do because you feel like you need to have your say. So I want to talk to you about pain. Because pain is inevitable. I didn't get many amens for that statement. <laughs> didn't get no one standing up and hooping, hollering and shouting me down for that statement. But it's as true as any other statement you would whoop and holler about. Pain is inevitable. If you're going to live life, pain is inevitable. And if you're going to lead, pain is for sure inevitable. But I guess what I want to teach you is what I wish someone had taught me years ago. The pain is, yes, inevitable, but no one told me that you can pick your pain. The best way I can illustrate this is to take you on a little adventure with me as I explain to you what happened to me this time, well, no, like January last year or the year before. For many, many years, my husband that is from this area has been on a campaign. And the campaign has been one that he has recruited other people into. The campaign was called Get Charlotte to Go Skiing. I did not grow up near mountains. I don't wake up in the morning wanting to fling myself off buildings or out of airplanes. And God did not give me that DNA. I am like, I have two legs. I don't need to attach things to them and throw myself down a hillside. I'm good. But my husband really wanted me to go skiing. And then my kids got on the bandwagon and they wanted to go skiing. And then our best friends loved to ski. So then they all joined the campaign trail. And I resisted and I resisted, but I had a moment of weakness. And in the moment of weakness over dinner at our friend's house, I said, okay, I'll go. Not knowing that in the next 10 minutes, the trip would be booked. <laughs> Money would have left our bank account so that I could not go back on what I said in my moment of weakness. So just over a year ago, I found myself on skis at the top of a mountain in the middle of France. We had an instructor and my kids clearly straight away got the skiing bug, knew what they were doing, and now they were stuck with the embarrassing mother who was snow plowing and holding everybody else up. So my kids looked at me lovingly and said, "Mum." we really don't want to hang with you anymore. We kind of want to go with dad and the others that know how to ski so you can have the instructor all to yourself. <laughs> Thanks, kids. So Billy No Friends had a full day on the mountain while they went off skiing and the instructor had gone home and I just thought to myself, I'm going to beat this thing. I'm going to beat this fear because I don't like heights. I don't like being out of control. I don't like ice. And there was icy conditions. The snow was really bad. So it was pretty much sheet ice with a thin layer of fake snow over the top. I'm just giving you the context for what I'm about to tell you. I go up the mountain in the cable car. No one's with me. I get to the top of the mountain and I'm like, I'm going to beat this. I am not letting my family be without me all week. I'm going to beat this thing. I get on the skis. I go down the hill, and as I'm coming down this mountainside, I get faster. <laughs> and now I'm getting a little too fast because it's icy, and, and then something awful happens. My skis cross at the front. And because I don't know what I'm doing, I have no clue how to uncross my skis. And so now I'm stuck going fast from the top of the mountain with cross skis, and now I'm rounding a bend with cross skis. And as I round the bend, my eyes see something that makes my heart sink. Because right round the bend on the top of the mountainside was a ski school for five-year-old children <laughs> who at that present moment in time were practicing a snowplow by all holding onto each other's poles in a long line that went the entire length of the mountain and here comes crazy out of control English lady who does not speak French with her skis crossed and I know in that moment pain is in my future. 
I know pain is coming for me. It is inevitable. I, I can't stop it. I, I, I can't head it off. And some of you right now, you know, or you're in the middle of, I know pain is coming. That staff member's going to leave. That confrontation's going to happen. That situation's going to go down. When I get home, there's going to be World War Three in that department. This change is going to upset them. When I preach this on Sunday, some people are going to be mad at me. You know pain is in your future. But in that moment, what I began to realize is I have two choices. I can actually pick my pain. Because what I could see as I'm coming round, and it was a flash, it's happening so fast, but I could see in that moment there's two choices. I go left, and if I go left, there is a pile of snow. But there are also a big group of kids. But if I go left, I will probably take several young people with me but eventually we'll all end up in the snow. If I go left, I can soften my blow, but I will injure others. Or I saw in that split second to the right that two kids had dropped the ski that they were holding and there was a tiny gap. And I realized if I go right, I can't see what's at the other side of that drop, but if I go right, no other child will be injured. I will take the hit but no one else will be hurt. And in that split second, I had to pick my pain. I call these two options that I want to teach you about today, collateral damage or personal pain. And in that moment, I took my skis under my arm, I picked up speed, and I headed for the gap between the two kids. I went over the edge and I bump, bump, bumped down the hillside and took a blow to my own body, but no one else was injured. And in that moment, I felt the Spirit of God say, and so are your choices in leadership. You get to choose. Pain is inevitable. People are going to leave. Things are going to be set. There's going to be death in the pot. But you have a choice every time as a leader to take the option that is collateral damage or take the option that is personal pain. So let me for a moment break down the difference in these two choices. And maybe this will make you say ow a little bit today, but maybe it will also give you some flour for your pocket because I'm pretty sure there are more people being wiped out than need to be. There are more people hearing conversations than need to be. There are more people spreading rumors than need to be. There are more people offended than need to be because instead of taking flour from our pocket by picking our pain well, we have allowed it to become a collateral damage scene. And I just think we can do better, but it will cost us personally a lot more. So, what do the differences look like? Well, if you are a person that picks collateral damage, then you will always go for retaliation. If you're a person that picks personal pain, you will go for preservation. There was a story in the Bible, remember, where they came to grab Jesus? They came to grab Jesus and Peter as he sees them coming towards Jesus, Peter pulls out a sword and he gets his sword because he's annoyed and he's mad and he can see pains coming. And so everything inside him as a young leader wants to protect Jesus and in that moment he pulls out his sword in retaliation and he lobs off the ear of the guard. I got this. They hurt you, I'll hurt them. They say that about you, I'll say that about them. I, I, I got it. I, I took his ear off for you, Jesus. And Jesus picks up the ear, looks at Peter, and says, what's about to happen is personal pain. And on the way to the personal pain, I don't need any retaliation. He sticks the ear back on the soldier. Some of us have got cabinets full of ears. We could open our 
drawer and we could show you the ears. But I have a question for you. What use is that ear to you? What does it add to your ministry? There was another time when the disciples were walking along the road with Jesus. And in Luke 9, verse 51, they're strolling along this road with Jesus. And then they hear people begin to say stuff about Jesus. And they hear that they're not being welcomed. And they hear that there's opposition. And in Luke 9, it says that James and John were hearing all this. And they said, Lord, should we call down fire? <laughs> should we call down some fire? and destroy those people that are being mean to us? I mean, should we just burn them up? Should we just trash talk them around town? Should we just put out a Facebook post about what they actually said? I mean, Jesus, let's just call down some fire right now because that's what they deserve, Jesus. And in the Message Bible, it says that Jesus responds and says, do you not know that that is not the spirit that you are from? I want to say to some of you, you need to teach your team. That is not the spirit that we are from. Because retaliation is going to cause collateral damage. But instead, we're going to shake the dust off our feet. And we're going to carry on on our mission. And it might hurt and you might have to cry tonight into your pillow. And you might have to get on your knees and say, God, I, I feel the pain. And God will meet you in that moment, but you will be able to rest your head at night knowing I didn't take anyone out that I shouldn't have taken out. And you need to look at your team. Find where the hotheads are. And say, I need to give you some flour for your pocket. Because you're going to end up with a drawer full of ears. And I think God has something better for you. You need to pull the one over that is always in your office saying, but they said, but it's not fair. I say, I need you to sit down because I want to give you some flour for your pocket. Because if you want to survive in ministry, <laughs> you're going to need a lot of flour. You're going to need how to pick your pain. Secondly, if you're a collateral damage leader, you will always put self over serve. It will always be your agenda that chooses the direction you take on the hillside. It will be your achievement that decides whether you go left or right. It will be the thing that you feel is most important rather than what is most important to the bigger picture that decides which where you go on the hill. Proverbs 16, verse 18, in the Passion Translation, says your boast becomes a prophecy of a future failure. Think about that. It's been so many times in my journey when the options are self or serve, where I could come out looking real good, but it would not have served God's agenda. When I could have come out saying, hey, I'm the good girl, but it would have been about my boast and not about what God wanted to happen most. In your departments, on your team, Listen in the conversation for self or serve. For one will lead to collateral damage and the other will lead to the bigger picture staying intact. It's exactly what Pastor Kevin has written about in his book. It are those tests that you must go through. The self or serve test is a test you must walk through. You must pick your pain. If you're a collateral damage person, you're all about denial. <laughs> but if you're a personal pain person, you're all about ownership. The 
flower in your pocket is you're going to own up. I don't know if you have raised children, but raising our kids, this is something that I know only too well because when someone has done something in the home, when a crime has been committed, you as a parent begin to interrogate all the suspects. Was it you? Was it you? And depending on how many children you have, this can be a long process. And how many of you know the process goes on and on if denial is in the camp? Because, well, no one's owning up, so I'm just going to have to punish everybody. You'll all sit on the naughty step. You'll all go to bed early. You will all go without treats this weekend because someone in here is lying. And so now, because someone is deciding to deny, everybody is collateral damage. Because no one's putting their hand up going, it was me that said that about the trustee department. It was me that left the equipment out and it got stolen. So stop the search. It was me that said the comment about the other person on our team because I was mad. It was me, so release the other prisoners. It was me. Can I tell you as a parent, when one of my kids doesn't deny and instead assumes ownership, I don't want to discipline them. I want to hug them because they just saved me hours of time. <laughs> Your confession has delivered me from policing the whole household. Your, your admittance of the error means we can move forward so much faster. And now we can actually have progress. Why do we regress sometimes? We, we go backwards. We become so immature. So immature to deny. We know it because we see it in our immature children. But then as an adult, we think, well, if I can get away with it, if I just don't say anything, if I just, it, maybe I'll just ride it out. No, no, it was me that made the mistake. So stop punishing the team. It was me that started the bad attitude. It was me that put the death in the pot. It was me that has pride. I don't want you to take the whole worship team to one side and tell them off because it was me that set the bad example, not showing up on time. One is collateral damage. Jesus taught the disciples about denial. He said, it's not a good idea. He taught Peter, you will deny me, and I'm going to help restore you, because I need to teach you. Denial causes collateral damage. But if you'll just own it, Peter, I'm going to restore you. I'm going to bring you back to life. And you'll have flour in your pocket for the rest of your life. When Zacchaeus met Jesus, just being in Jesus' presence was enough for Zacchaeus to say, thank you for being in my home. But you being here makes me aware of all the collateral damage my life has caused. And today, I don't just accept you, but I take ownership of all the wrong things I have done, and I'm gonna volunteer to go back and pay back what it is that I have done wrong. And in that moment, Zacchaeus didn't just become a believer, but he became a leader, because he said, I'm not gonna live my life anymore causing collateral damage. I'm gonna own up, and I'm gonna take the personal pain and fix what it is that is broken. And maybe in this generation, this last one I'm going to leave with you is, it's everywhere. Collateral damage people look for public sympathy. Personal pain people take private suffering. There has never been a time when this 
is be more lived out than now. All you have to do is go on Facebook or Instagram to read the post that is looking for public sympathy while causing collateral damage. The person that leaves the church with a bad attitude, the next post reads, do not be controlled. Do not allow the dream in your heart to be stifled by controlling voices. And you know, buddy, I know this is not an innocent post. I know you're offended that I told you you couldn't do your outreach when you wanted to do it. And I know now you're posting on social media a spiritual post to cover up something that is a, a, an offense in you. And, and, and listen to me. And then you go on and you read all the people that are commenting underneath. <laughs> yeah, bro. Right with you, bro. And you know that same person left their church for the same reason. And now we've got public sympathy going on because why should I suffer alone? I'm just going to take a few more people down with me. Be careful what you like on social media. Engage your brain when you're reading it and put it through a filter saying, if my church followed this wisdom, would they be healthy? There's never been a time like it. Instagramming and Facebooking and tweeting and sounds spiritual, but actually if you look at it, it's somebody that knew pain was in their future. And when pain came to them, they said, you know what, I don't like it. So you know what, I'm gonna hurt you and I'm gonna hurt you and I'm gonna hurt you and I'm gonna make it look like I'm the hero. But we all know in the wake of that decision, you just took down a load of innocent people and there's a whole generation that are watching on Instagram, people's public sympathy posts and they have no idea what they're liking. They have no idea what they're following and it's time for the church leadership to say, I have flower in my pocket. I have flower in my pocket. And that's not how we do it. That's not how we build. Listen to me. Listen to me. Jesus, about to go to the cross. Man, if there was ever a time he could have put out a post for public sympathy. He could have written an Instagram that said, I healed your kid. I opened your blind eyes. I sat and taught you. I sat all day ministering amongst you. You all owe me. He knew he was facing pain. It's inevitable. The cross is in my future. I can go get public sympathy. I can send the disciples out on a campaign. But where do you find Jesus? You find him on his knees. He don't want public sympathy. He's saying, I'm going to take private suffering. And he gets on his knees and he says, not my will, but yours be done. Pain is in my future. And there's so many that are saying things that are not true. But I refuse to use my last breaths to gain public sympathy. Instead, I take private suffering. Instead, I bleed, sweat, drops of blood. And I want to close with this incredible piece of scripture and I'm going to read it to you and it blew my mind when I was going through my own season because you know messages don't come to you unless you've walked this stuff <laughs> 2 Corinthians 7 10 to 16 in the message Bible puts it this way pain Distress, 
that drives us to God, it turns us around and it gets us back in the way of salvation. Listen to these next lines. We will never regret that kind of pain. But those who let pain, distress, drive them away from God, they are full of regrets and end up on a deathbed of regrets. But listen to this, and this is the flower for your pocket. Isn't it wonderful? All the ways in which this kind of pain, distress, has made you closer to God. Look what this pain does. It makes you more alive. It makes you more concerned. It makes you more sensitive. It makes you more reverent. I love this next one. It makes you more human. It makes you more passionate. And it makes you more responsible. Looked at from any angle, you've come out of this with a purity of heart. And that is what I was hoping for in the first place when I wrote this letter. When you choose the right pain, it will add something to your ministry that has more passion, more reverence, more depth, more humanity, more understanding, more wisdom, more sensitivity, more responsibility. This kind of pain, it drives you into the presence of God. And here's what I want to let you know as I close and I'm going to pray over you. I want you all to stand to your feet around the room. It would be irresponsible of me to close there. It would be not human of me to close there because let me tell you, private pain hurts just as bad. I'm not saying this pain doesn't hurt. When I went off the side of that mountain, no one saw it. None of my family were with me. I managed to get back up and I went back to the cabin and I didn't tell anybody. The next morning when I got up, I realized I'm pretty banged up and bruised, but I didn't want to draw attention to it. And my friend's husband, he noticed that I was wincing when I went to pick up my skis. He said, are you okay? I said, don't tell anyone, but I had a fall yesterday. He said, for the rest of the week, I'm going to carry your boots and your skis. And here's what I want you to know. When you choose the right kind of pain, God will send people into your world. And they'll just know, I see you bruised. I see you took a hit. I see you injured yourself so that they wouldn't be injured. So here's my gift to you. I'm just gonna pick up your skis and I'm gonna carry your boots so that you can heal faster. And inside this room, some of you, your best gift right now to others is to go to them at some point over the next few hours and say, hey, that decision you made, it cost you. So here's my commitment to you. I'm gonna carry your skis. I'm gonna pray for you. I'm gonna sow seed into you. I'm gonna love on you. I'm gonna check in with you. I didn't need to all, all the details, but I know you took a hit because pain is pain. But when you choose the right pain, God will send you people who speak a language that reactionary people don't speak. And if the voices in your life as a leader right now are telling you to retaliate, you got the wrong people. And if the voices in your life right now are saying you should post it and let everybody know, you've got the wrong people. And if the voices right now are churning up the anger inside of you and feeding the frustration inside you, you've got the wrong people. Find the flower people. Find the people that say, I see it, I taste it, but I have flower in my pocket. So I just want you to close your eyes. And I just want you, wherever this finds you, if you're saying, you know what, God? I'm feeling a little bashed up. I'm feeling a little tender. I'm feeling a little bruised. I, now I know why. I, just lift your hands. 
Because the first place that your help comes from is God himself. He, in this moment, for some of you, is going to take the skis. He's going to lift the boots. Some of you, you've been betrayed and you've been hurt and the people you thought that would never leave you have walked out on you and you are left reeling in your mind. But I'm here to tell you that you're choosing right. You're choosing well. God sees it. God is no man's debtor. He sees it and, and he will repay you for it. And it's going to make you better as a leader. It's going to make you better as a pastor. It's going to make you better as a team builder because you're picking the right pain. And, and in the interim where the bruises are hurting and the, and the muscles are stretched, God's right now sending, right now is sending. They're on their way to you. People that say, I'm going to pick up your skis and I'm going to carry your boots. And right now as you lift your hands, he's going to lift some stuff off your shoulders and some weight off of you. And if a tear has to fall, then you let it fall. And if you just have to say, God, I, I've chosen, I've picked this pain, but God, I need you in this pain to help me, to hold me, then God right now will meet you in it. God, you see the hands all across this room raised. And God, I thank you for every courageous leader that is putting flour in their pocket. Everyone that is saving the stew instead of throwing it out. Everyone who's bending the knee instead of opening their mouth. Everyone who's withholding from posting on social media while others are posting all their rubbish and gossip. God, I thank you for every leader that is standing on your word and holding onto their peace. And I pray in this moment by the Spirit of God that you would soothe their pain, that you would lift their skis, that you would carry their boots, that you would send to them those that will help lift the burden. Oh God, I pray right now as they lift their hands, a lightness will come. As they lift their 